The U.S. and Russia here in Paris represented at a conference on Lebanon by their uh, top diplomats. Uh, the discussion, of course, centering uh, for a long time this meeting had been planned on the Syria spillover, what it means for refugees, one million and counting inside Lebanon, and the announcement of uh, Saudi money to buy $3 billion worth of French weapons for the Lebanese army. Uh, Saudi Arabia and Russia, two nations that hold some of the cards in Syria's three-year-old civil war. Will the standoff over Ukraine soften or toughen Moscow's stance on Syria? We'll also see if the players in Syria and Lebanon are feeling the effect of that almighty row brewing among Gulf states, what with Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates recalling their ambassadors to Qatar this Wednesday, backing uh, various shades of Islamist rebels inside of Syria. Today, uh, in the France 24 debate, we're looking at shifting sands in the Middle East. With us to talk about it, Emma Suleiman, uh, who's a communication consultant, former spokesperson of the Syrian National Council. Welcome back to the debate. Welcome back as well to uh, Ardavan Amir Aslani, analyst and attorney. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for From Beirut, me. retired uh, Lebanese General Hisham Jaber with the Middle East Center for Studies and Political Affairs. Thank you for joining us again. And from Thank Doha, you. David Roberts, lecturer at King's College in London. Uh, thanks for joining us. The France Vanquette debate, where you can join the conversation on Facebook and on Twitter, our hashtag uh, F24Debate. Let me start. Um, let me start with you, uh, David Roberts, the U.S. Secretary of State uh, in Paris. So is the U.K. Foreign Secretary, the French Foreign Minister, the German Foreign Minister, and the Russian uh, Foreign Minister. Um, the talk is on the agenda is about Lebanon. Of course, Ukraine overshadowing things. My question to you, and it's one that we've been asking ourselves all week. Um, is the standoff over Ukraine going to alter Moscow's stance when it comes to Syria? It's a very good question, of course. Um, it has to fit into it. I mean, this, is a, this could be used by Russia. It depends how the situation unfolds. They could use it to their advantage. It is, to some degree, potentially a carrot that they could offer. Or, of course, it could be a stick that they use. Um, it, it very much depends on, on how the issues unfold and how the diplomacy plays out. Um, Ardavan Amir Aslani, I heard one U.S. base analyst here this week emphatic that uh, Russia is going to give up a lot more now when it comes to Syria because Ukraine matters more to them. I think that the exact opposite is true. What we're witnessing today, pursuant to the Russian military intervention in Crimea, is about the launching of a new Cold War. And this means that every single party involved in the Syria matter is going to get more and more entrenched in the current positions. This means that Russia will be less likely, even than before, to embark upon any kind of a negotiated settlement in Syria. They're going to stand by Assad even more than before, provide him with all the ammunition that he needs, all the moral support that he needs, all the political support that he needs, and all the vetoing power that Russians wield at the UN Security Council that he needs, and he'll stay in power they're going to be much more adamant than before, because now it's about positioning their influence in the area. The Americans have embarked upon a confrontational attitude against the Russians. They've talked about sanctions against certain Russian officials. They've talked about even military options that are never off the table. Now, in this current climate, do you think that Russians would be inclined to become much more uh, amiable towards the U.S. student attitude or even reduce their support for Assad? The exact opposite is going to happen. But it's a bit confusing, right? We're getting these mixed signals because you see Sergei Lavrov and John Kerry shaking hands together in the same room. No, it's, it's, it's a big world. Um, these are world powers. They are obliged to deal with each other. And the Ukrainian matter is not only about Ukraine. It's about you know, energy. It's about European dependence on Russian gas. It's about the Middle East. It's about Russia ending up maybe tomorrow with a NATO member on its borders. So there are multiple dimensions to this conflict. It's not only about Crimea. It's about a vast array of subjects. It's about power in the, the entire region of the Middle East, including the southern part of Europe. So the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, anti is quite up over there. Hisham Jaber, do you agree that uh, what's going on in Ukraine means that Moscow is going to dig in its heels even more when it comes to Syria? Yes, of course. I think any pressure on uh, Russia, on Ukraine, or if they want to reduce the influence of Moscow 
in Ukraine, it will uh, put Moscow in a position to increase and it's, uh, you know, uh, help to Syria and its interest to Syria and its support to regime in Syria. Because I don't think Moscow is that naive uh, to lose in Ukraine and in Syria at the same time. I think in Ukraine they will arrive to have a settlement to respect the interest of Russia in some respect, and especially Ukraine is the backyard of Russia or the front yard. But at the same time, you know, if, uh, if they believe that uh, uh, Moscow will give up in Syria or will reduce its support to the Syrian regime, they are wrong. Emma Suleiman. I totally disagree. <laughs> Sorry, I agree. I totally agree. Yeah. But let me ask you then, where does it leave? Uh, we've seen images today of the of the Arab League UN envoy, Lakhdar Brahimi. Where does it leave those Geneva peace talks we've been focusing on so much, these attempts to get uh, uh, the uh, Syrians to speak in the same room, attempts that have been pushed so much together, jointly, by Moscow and Washington? Well, the Geneva too... Uh what is the Geneva tour at the first place? It was just a phase of uh, a dialogue uh, sponsored by uh, by Russia and uh, and the U.S. As long as these uh, two guys do not settle for an agreement, Geneva two will not lead into anywhere. I mean, there has been two uh, round round one and round two. What what did, what was the outcome of these two rounds? Nothing. The only achievement was that was having the regime. And the opposition sit on one table, and they, not, not even one single uh, thing. Can... You say you say nothing, but uh, there was that uh, humanitarian corridor for the city of Homs. There was that was that was unrelated to Geneva too. This was coordinated. Unrelated? This was coordinated uh, since a while. I mean, the the humanitarian uh, NGOs were trying to coordinate this since a while. It seemed applies to Yarmouk. Uh, this has this Palestinian is totally, refugee this camp is totally, in Damascus. Yes, this was uh, unrelated to Geneva too. Geneva too, literally, the outcome of Geneva too, round one and, and two is nothing. The only achievement was, as I said uh, earlier, is having the regime, uh, having the regime sit for the, for the first time ever with its opposition, recognize the opposition. That was the outcome. So uh, uh, now we don't know what's going on about the uh, a third round of uh, round if it's going to happen or not. And uh, I think I agree. Russia will not give up on on Syria now because it's it's one of uh, it's uh, the, the key the key card that it plays uh, in the region. So uh, it's all about positioning. All right. Let me phrase the question differently <laughs> to you, Emma. Okay. Do you think that um, having John Kerry and Sergey Lavrov working together to try to get everyone around the table is important, or? Is it proven to just be a waste of time and it's not going to change it's, the outcome? It's important as long as, as they have settled for something. If they didn't settle, we cannot settle because, I mean, regime follows what the Russia, uh, what the Russian wants. They have an agenda that they follow. Uh, same for the most of the opposition, not necessarily the American agenda, but uh, they have various agendas that they, they follow. So the, 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 the conflict would not settle unless the regional and international power would settle down to an agreement. Hisham Jaber, you agree? Yes, I do. All right, uh, agreement uh, on, on that score uh, as well. Um, going forward, though, this does not bode well then for Syria. Unfortunately, the tragedy of the Syrian people will continue. As we know, beyond all these talks about geopolitics, their human lives, their, their people suffering on a daily basis, God knows how many hundreds of thousands may die in the next years or so. But it's also about power, and it goes beyond Syria. The poor Syrian people have been taken hostage today in a confrontation that goes beyond their frontiers. It's about Iran. It's about Russia wielding its influence in the Middle East. It's about the Saudis trying to position their own forces in the area. And they have been stuck in the middle. And what is going to happen tomorrow, and the issues that you will probably talk about later during the day about the conflict within the GCC, is that you have two different versions of Islam that are currently opposed to each other in Syria. One is the, the uh, Qatari version, which is primarily based on the Muslim Brotherhood version, and the other one is the Saudi version, which is the radical Salafi version. And they are fighting against each other more than they are concentrating on the uh, regime troops and losing any kind of credibility that may, they may have had in the past on the ground. 
We should not also forget that this Ukrainian issue will also have genu genuine consequences in relation to energy. Let us remember that 24% or quarter of all Europe's gas needs comes from Russia. Now, if this Cold War scenario is going to play out in front of our eyes, Europe will need to buy out its dependence on Russian gas. And what are the existing options out there? Not much. It will also have implications on the Iranian nuclear issue. Are the Iranians are going to find themselves hardened and more adamant in adopting a stronger position against the West? Or are the Americans going to assuage the worries of the Iranians and try to bring them as quickly as possible into their camps? So as for Iranian gas, which is the largest reserves proof in the world, according to BP's 2013 benchmark report, to be the alternative to Russian gas, which the Russians are also aware of. So we are looking at a conflict with multiple dimensions, religious, geopolitical, military, as well as energy. All right. And of course, it's not just Syria feeling the effect on Twitter. Uh, we have this comment, Lebanon needs a uni unified strategy for Syria refugees, one million and counting. Some press reports say those numbers could quadruple the way things uh, are going. Uh, refugees. Uh, that is, of course, high on the minds uh, of uh, those leaders that have been meeting in Paris this Wednesday, the French president uh, speaking at the outset of that conference. The international community must be mobilized for Lebanon. That's what it's doing today. It's mobilized on three fronts. The refugees in Lebanon first. Certain sums were already agreed on. They must be given fully and be increased. The second priority is to boost the Lebanese economy. The third priority is the need to guarantee Lebanon's security. The Lebanese army must be equipped with the necessary material. France and Saudi Arabia have contributed to that. All right, a lot in that statement by François Hollande. Before we talk about Saudi Arabia, I just want to talk about the refugees for one second with Hisham Jaber. Hisham, um, I know yours is a country uh, where you have a delicate balance of power that uh, uh, was set out long, long ago, decades ago. With all of these refugees, a lot of people are fearing, Lebanese people I've been speaking to say, they fear that that balance is going to be completely upset. What are your thoughts on that? Of course, uh, one million refugees in a country which uh, doesn't have population more than uh, four uh, million, you go on the street, you find one Syrian and maybe two Lebanese, then one Syrian. One million refugees, Syrian refugees came to Lebanon, besides 400,000 Palestinians, at least. It's a big problem for Lebanon. Those refugees create a social problem, economic problem, and also security problem. If we do estimate that among one million, we do have 100 young men who are who did their military service in Syria and they are capable to use weapons. Can you imagine if any side uh, provide weapons uh, to those Syrians who are in Lebanon and we will have uh, they will participate in any conflict, whether they are with the regime, half and half, or against the regime. It's a big problem. I think Lebanese government start to feel uh, that there is really a security problem uh, beside the economic problem and the social problem in Lebanon. And, and, and over clear. the long term, would you say, Hisham, that uh, uh, that constitution uh, of Lebanon is under threat by uh, this influx of, uh, of people uh, from uh, Syria? No, no, of course, yes. Uh, we don't know when the Syrian crisis will, uh, will have end. And uh, they, maybe we do expect more refugees. You know, maybe in, uh, if the uh, next year we will we'll have maybe two million. There is no control on this. And I don't think Lebanon can handle uh, this uh, problem alone. Uh, Lebanon needs... Uh, uh, quick and uh, economic support, uh, maybe foreign aids, maybe whatever, you know. And also, and as we said in the uh, security problem, the Lebanese army and the Lebanese security services, they are not, you know, in this time, uh, have the capability to have all those refugees under control. Especially Lebanon is, uh, the army of Lebanon is occupied many, many, in many places in Lebanon is facing also the terrorism 
which start to increase its uh, operations in Lebanon. Uh, it's very important, and I did not understand uh, the meeting in Paris today uh, was not clear how they will help Lebanon. We didn't hear any uh, any uh, concrete numbers of, uh, you know, uh, amount or numbers of any grant or any obligation to any side. With all respect, you know, to all, all countries, very important countries, I had that meeting in Paris. And we heard President Hollande said that France will help Lebanon and Lebanese army will be equipped with this Saudi grant. And, grant. and we don't know yet what are the weapons accepted, you know, uh, well, we could talk. For, I'm going to interrupt be, you because we're going to talk about yeah. those weapons uh, right after we come back from the break. But I just want to, one final point on this issue of the refugees with David Roberts. David, is there really an existential threat to Lebanon here? I suppose if, if back to, to the 80s uh, and around that time, you saw just a huge amount of potential for, for problems in Lebanon. The civil war, obviously enough. And I think if you just go to the, the very basic numbers that the previous discussant mentioned, you know, the sheer the proportion of uh, refugees, as it were, to an already struggling country in many ways, or struggling politically, certainly. And it, it has to be considered in, you know, existential is a very emotive term, if you will, but it has to be considered in the most serious, most serious context, certainly. I think... Uh... The problem is you cannot isolate Lebanon from Syria. These two countries have strong binding, and whatever happens in Lebanon affects Syria. Whatever happens in Syria affects Lebanon. So is your question about the refugee or the, the stability of Lebanon? The stability of Lebanon in terms of the numbers, of the balance between uh, there's this huge mosaic between Sunnis and Shiites, and uh, Syria, can, the Syria. list is long of different groups. Syria and Lebanon uh, have the same complexity of uh, mix of uh, sectarian uh, religious uh, sects, so it's, it has the same mosaic, and uh, and they're similar in so many cases. And you know what we say in in, in Syria and in Lebanon: once it rains on Syria, you open your umbrella in Lebanon. So once affects the other. There have been a strong economical uh, relationship in the past during wars in Lebanon. Lebanese refugees came to Syria. This is the first time that Syrian refugees goes uh, goes to Lebanon because they don't have any uh, any other option. I mean, I think Lebanon is uh, is, is next door. But um, so it's one and the same. I'm going to interrupt you because we're going to take a quick break. Right. So goes Syria. So goes Lebanon. We'll see if Lebanon can uh, shore itself up and protect itself. Hisham Jaber was talking about it. Stay with us. More to come here in the France 24 debate.